Hi, good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started today. Um, my name is Meta Polywall with the Orange County Water District. And thank you so much for joining us for our webinar, PFAS Impacts and Policy Solutions. And uh, we have a great, great discussion ahead of us today, but um, I just wanted to mention a couple of items before we get started. Um, we are in webinar mode, so our attendees um, are muted to reduce background noise. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on the OCWD website and YouTube channel. And lastly, we encourage you to submit your questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. And following our panel discussion, uh, we will have an, audi an audience Q&A and we'll do our best to address questions most applicable to the webinar topic and information presented today. Uh, we do anticipate receiving a lot of questions and uh, we'll do our best to address them all live. Um, but we also have a team here to provide um, any kind of written responses um, as well. And we've also received some questions during the uh, registration process and, and we'll do our best to address those today. Um, however, in the event that we're not able to um, address any of the questions live today, uh, please know that we will uh, provide written responses uh, following the webinar. So without further ado, I would like to invite OCWD Board President, Steve Sheldon, who will moderate today's discussion to get us started. Thank you, Meta. I appreciate the, the introduction. Let's see my, is my video turning on? Not yet. Well, that's okay, I'll just get, th I'll thank you for the, for the, the pre-work and the introduction. I'm Steve Sheldon, President of the Orange County Water District. We are here to talk about the legislative issues rela related to PFAS and how the, this PFAS has affected water agencies, wastewater agencies, and now to ratepayers as well. In Orange County, we we have found PFAS in our in, in our drinking water, and we are working very hard. We'll be able to talk about that how we're getting rid of it from the drinking water. Our um, our aquifer uh, provides water to 2.5 million people in our service area in Orange County, and 77% of the water to, to these 2.5 million residents comes from the aquifer. The balance of the 20, 22% comes from imported water from the Delta and the Colorado River. Uh, the um, agencies uh, throughout the US and in here in Orange County and state are affected by PFAS, and there's various ways. And one way is when we clean up the PFAS, um, there are potential liabilities and we have a program that we are asking the Congress to provide an exemption to the water district. So I want to uh, now go into a couple of slides and to provide an exemption to water and wastewater agencies. I'm, here we go, okay, couldn't see it. So um, the, in, uh, in, in 2016, the Environmental Protection Agency, I'm kind of giving a background of how we got here, um, established the, uh, 20 parts per trillion combined lifetime health advisory for PFOA and PFOS. Then in 2021, the EPA has uh, form promulgated a formal regulatory determination to begin the M MCL process for PFOA and PFOS to create a new uh, maximum contaminant level. Concurrently, or actually a year before, the state um, put forth new levels of, of PFOA at 10 parts per trillion and PFOS at 40 parts per trillion. And by lowering it, they've uh, taken a lot of the existing water that we've been serving and have made some of that water um, subject to these PFAS regulations and subject to treatment. Um, and here in, in July, 2021, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment called OWIHA, it released draft proposed health, public health goals to review for PFOA and PFOS. So, the uh, OIHA is looking to update these regulations and potentially increase the level of parts per trillion. So let's go to the next slide, please. So here at the Orange County Water District, we estimate that we will be spending uh, approximately a billion dollars for the design, construction, treatment of PFAS, and then the uh, operation maintenance over, over, 30, well, over 30 years we have 59 wells that are impacted. When the PFAS issue first came really to our attention, it's been on our attention, but uh, with the state regulations changing, our board enacted a policy that we would pay for 100% of the design and the construction 
and that we would share the operations and maintenance costs 50-50 with the affected city or affected water retailer. Next slide. So the PFAS issue is much larger than Orange County or California. It's a, it's a statewide issue. And there have been many uh, organizations that have stepped up and said that water districts and wastewater agencies, that when they treat the PFAS should be exempt and not subject to any type of liability as long as they follow the proper procedures and processes in treating it and disposing of it. And we'll hear a, a, a little more about, about that. But this um, letter just sort of shows all the logos of the various types of groups that are supporting the position that we're talking about, about today. So next, okay, I'd like now to introduce our panelists. Uh, Dennis Bilodeau is a colleague of mine. He's a director on the Orange County Water District, past president. And uh, Dennis has um, um, retailers within his service area that have been affected by PFAS. Stephen Tucker is the general manager of the Water Replenishment District of Los Angeles County. He'll be bringing his expertise in how they are dealing with PFAS. Adam Link is the executive director of the California Association, California Association of Sanitation Agencies, or CASA. And he will bring, of course, his expertise with, with the state of California. Eric Saperstein is the uh, president of ENS Resources. And Eric has also serves as a lobbyist for Orange County Water District, Orange County Sanitation District, and many other water and wastewater agencies throughout the nation. So with that, I want to now go to Stefan and say, and, and our first question, and um, because Stephen is close to Stefan, so Stefan, you get to go first. <laughs> and uh, in, in, in your district, you've had some of the agencies that are within your basin affected with, with, with PFAS. Tell us how, you know, how they've dealt with it, and some have and haven't, and what the potential costs are going to be for you. Uh, first of all, Steve, thanks for having me, um, and glad to be a part of this panel. Um, to date, we've had about 14 of our water purveyors that have been affected by PFAS, and that uh, totals about uh, somewhere between 36 and 40 wells um, that have actually been affected. Um, they have chosen to address this, this issue uh, in a number of different ways. Um, some of them just have chosen to notice for now uh, their constituents and um, then they, and then there's some that have chosen to build treatment systems. Uh, to the ones that have chosen to, to just notice their constituents, they have had just a moderate level of responses from their constituents based on the notice. Um, and then to those that have, have chosen to build, um, some of them have uh, completed treatment systems uh, and some of them are in the process or in the design process. Um, a little different from Orange County, uh, what the Water Replenishment District has, has chosen to do is has chosen to fund the capital, the design and construction of the, these water treatment systems um, to the point of up to $5 million per water purveyor or up to $2,000 per acre foot of annual uh, pumping rights pumping uh, capability that they have. Um, so with that, you know, our, our board has budgeted about $67 million that will be coming uh, from WRD funds to pay for this. Um, and then we're obviously seeking uh, some federal and state funds to help offset that cost um, for pay, to pay for that capital. We have not committed at all to uh, pay for any of the O and M for any of the water purveyors at this point, um, and that's how we're we're we chose to address it at this point. Um, we feel that the cost is much more than the sixty-seven million dollars. Uh, for instance, just today, when I uh, coming up here, I was leaving a um, capital improvement program uh, meeting where we were asking the board to approve another $5.8 million for city of Pico Rivera. Um, and they're asking for a total of $10 million. Uh, and it will cost them upwards of $10 million to complete their treatment system. Uh, but be, uh, based on the guidelines of our program, we are only asking to approve about $5.8 million of that. Um, so it's the cost is definitely going to be upwards of the $67 million that we're budgeting. Um, and uh, with the O and M, it's it's going to be significantly more than that. Interesting how the 
thank you. How the uh, different agencies have affected things differently, and some of your just some of your uh, districts did not or did send out the notice. Yes. And the the comments from the constituents weren't that great, or were not of, of a significant. No, they're relatively minor, and in some cases. Um... Uh, one water purveyor got one response from a constituent and that was a non PFOS related response. So got it. Um, just didn't, didn't hear much. You've got the piece there. Thank you. I'll move on to Adam. Adam, tell us um, here in California with, with uh, CASA, how are, how are your agencies addressing this issue and, and, and yourself as an organization? Yeah, of course. And I just want to say thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity to provide the wastewater perspective in this. This is a really important issue for us. And uh, just thank you for having me on the group. Um, we have a number of concerns related to PFAS. I think first and foremost is our efforts to kind of keep PFAS from ending our systems to begin with. I think those kind of source control initiatives are really a big concern for our agencies and something we're working on moving forward. Um, I think another one is just making sure that regulators are utilizing sound science in making their policy decisions. So making sure it doesn't jump ahead of where we're at in terms of determining effects and, and what's going on. So really making sure there's not too many, um, you know, reactionary things that don't follow the science at the state and federal level. And then the third one was kind of um, wanting to stay on the same page as the water community in terms of identifying and assigning responsibility to uh, producers and what we call kind of true sources of peace FOSS as we go through this process. and and making sure that we keep a focus on that. Um, another aspect of it I think it's really important for our folks is communications and messaging. Um, really, we don't wanna negatively affect the perception of things like water, recycled water, biosolids. Um, we don't wanna necessarily erode public confidence in those. I think we've done a really good job in the last 15, 20 years of sort of you know, convincing folks that, that this stuff is, is very high quality and we do a lot of work to treat it and I don't wanna do anything to kind of erode the confidence that's been built in that. Um, and then really providing context and distinguishing between places that have truly contaminated sites and ubiquitous background levels. I mean, PFAS, as you all know, is sort of in everything, and, but there's a huge difference between a contaminated site where it was used kind of in a very concentrated way and sort of the background levels that you'd find in the variety of residential uses um, that we all know. So making those communication messaging points, I think is really important to us. Um, and then obviously, I think other speakers will go into this a little more later, but um, you know, looking at some of the costs of potential treatment and cleanup and things like that, and making sure that any requirements related to those are really backed by robust financial support, um, whether it's federal or state level or, or producer responsibility. I mean, I think it's very important that um, this doesn't necessarily end up on the backs of rate payers going forward. So that's a big one. And then, you know, the last one is something, as you mentioned, you showed our CASA's logo was on that coalition level and federal level as well. But we are concerned of possible designation of PFAS as a hazardous substance at the federal level for circle liability purposes. And then what that would mean in terms of uh, wastewater agency involvement in litigation potentially where we're kind of a de minimis contributor or we've done everything we can based on our permits, based on rules and regulations but could still get sort of looped into these litigation efforts because of the designation. So that obviously remains a big concern for us. And, uh, you know, so not too much to be concerned about as, as you can hear, but. Thank you, Adam. You know, we do, as, as you mentioned earlier, I, I, I appreciate your thank you. We just intuitively consider the wastewater agency as our, as they're next door to us. And there are, uh, I don't want to say brother agency, sister agency, but they are our sibling agency, and we have worked with them since we started the groundwater replenishment system. And now, with we take a, you know, we we recycle 100% of all the sanitation uh, fluid that comes in, and so we're it's just a natural being a partner. And it's, I think you made a great point, changing to these are not contamination sites; this is incidental contaminants, so to speak. It's that you didn't do anything wrong. You're serving, you're, you're cleaning water. We're serving water. We've done nothing wrong. We're trying to address it. We need to clean it out of the water. And the whole point here is we want to be treated as the uh, good public entity that's doing that, not like the manufacturer who created the pollution in the first place. And we can kind of talk about that more. But uh, exactly. I'm, I'm, we're definitely uh, symbolic in this uh, issue that we're dealing with. So I'll, thank you. I'll turn now to Dennis Bilodeau. And uh, Dennis represents the city of Orange and the city of Villa Park. And I believe a North and 
Tustin area, unincorporated area in his service area. You have some PFAS in the area. Dennis, you're, you're going to talk about this. Talk about that a little bit. Please do. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, we've been heavily impacted in Orange County, not only in the cities that I serve, but beyond. We are constructing treatment facilities for 59 wells that are currently impacted and plan to have all facilities online in the next two years. Um, in Villa Park, uh, which is in my division, um, it's served by the Serrano Water District, and we have two wells there that are impacted. And actually, that's their treatment system you see in my uh, virtual background there. Um, just last month in February, that, that treatment system came online. And uh, this system can treat up to 4.6 million gallons of water a day. And uh, during the treatment process, PFOS gets removed before it goes into the domestic distribution system. Um, in the city of Orange, uh, we have a total of nine impacted wells and uh, all nine need full treatment to restore them uh, for use. Uh, four wellhead treatment systems are currently under construction and five more are in the design phase. Uh, and also in, uh, in Tustin, uh, we're, in, we're undergoing design work right now for two treatment plants that'll be built over the next two years. Um, it's an incredibly costly effort to design and build these treatment plants. Uh, construction costs alone are well over about $4.7 million per, uh, per unit. Um, adding to that cost, it costs about $1.5 million a year for 30 plus years to, to operate uh, and maintain each of these treatment systems. And on top of all of that, there's the cost of purchasing imported water due to wells being shut down, which could increase monthly water bills for our ratepayers. Um, that is why our response to PFOS not only includes solutions like treatment facilities and advocating for legislation oh, that we're talking about today, but we're also looking to hold the responsible parties accountable in court. And as a result, uh, the OCWD and 10 of our retailer, retail producers uh, jointly filed a lawsuit against several companies uh, that manufactured and sold PFOS that have contaminated our groundwater our drinking water and real property in Orange County. Um, through this lawsuit, OCWD and our partners uh, seek to protect ratepayers and ensure that the associated costs, including but not limited to treatment and replacement water are being borne by the companies that developed and manufactured the PFOS. Uh, the bottom line is we need to uphold the polluter pays principle to ensure that our ratepayers are protected and PFOS that was caused by chemical manufacturers uh, and they need to be accountable, be held accountable for their actions. Thanks. Thank you, Dennis. That's quite an answer. Appreciate it. Um, in all sincerity, um, you know, it's a, it's a serious problem and it's really something that has come up and we've known about it, but it's really come more directly in our face to our attention in just recent years. And, you know, as, as an Orange County resident for 50 years, I've been you know, drinking out of a water hose when I was little and drinking the water here. And, and it's just something that we, you know, it's probably been there for quite a long time. And now it's the, the levels are raising and the science is getting, is changing and science are not, or rather science is improving as to the impacts. And so we need to be very cognitive of, of that, of that. I'm going to turn to Eric, our, uh, Eric, Eric Saverstein, our lobbyist in Washington, D.C. And Eric, kind of now we're going to talk really the meat, the legislation and what you're doing and, and what's going on with wastewater agencies, water agencies, and how this will uh, affect us and what, what you think we should do, what you think we should do about it. Eric. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. And uh, let me echo the earlier comments that um, Orange County Water District should be congratulated for putting this briefing together. And specifically, Steve, your uh, leadership on this issue has been outstanding. I think a couple of things. A lot of the issues legislatively were touched on by the earlier speakers. Let me let me suggest to you that this started, shall we say, in 2019 when the House originally tried to pass legislation to effectively regulate PFOS, including imposing uh, Superfund designation, if you will, on PFOS chemicals. Um, so from 2019 till today, there's been this legislative debate going on on how best to uh, regulate, clean up these chemicals that are affecting groundwater supplies and drinking water supplies in general, and in the wastewater process, putting pressure on wastewater treatment operators to add another priority uh, constituent to take care of. I think 
what we need to understand is that as much as the House has approved its legislative vehicle, which is known as the PFOS Action Act, H.R. 2467, it went through the House and is sitting in the Senate, there remains to be a, shall we say, consensus in the Senate on how to proceed with moving forward on cleaning up PFAS chemicals, identifying what the regulatory standards should be. So that, is, from a legislative standpoint, things are sort of in a state of suspended animation as a Senate uh, committee with jurisdiction on this environment public works seeks to find a common way forward with the uh, members to develop consensus legislation. That said, um, some of the points that we have been working on with other members of the water sector that you pointed out in that joint letter that Adam mentioned um, is to effectively address the liability issue and the standard setting issue. Two critical points of, uh, of shall we say, debate. The first is we need to make certain that the polluter pays principle prevails in any final PFAS legislation. Um, the challenge for the community at large is that the House bill essentially directs EPA to designate these chemicals as hazardous substances under Superfund or CERCLA as it's now. And if that were to happen, because of the way Superfund liability is designed, you run the risk of being as a water agency or a wastewater treatment operator brought into potential cleanup liability circumstances simply because you accepted a wastewater or you treated a water supply that was required under your, under your permit conditions to provide a critical public service and a public health service, and that is water supply and clean water improvements. So that's been a uniting uh, factor for the water sector. The second thing is the importance of developing national drinking water standards that are based on sound science, as opposed to just throwing out a standard and then having it take effect. And so that is the other unifying force, uh, you know, because there has been a lot of debate over how EPA should issue uh, a standard setting process. Um, I think what's good is that with the EPA's roadmap, strategic PFOS roadmap, they've laid out a schedule that seems to reinforce the importance of using sound science, um, identifying you know, what the source of the pollution is and to maintain the premise that the polluter pays. That's in the roadmap, that's the priorities of the roadmap, but as we have been working this policy issue here in Washington, we run smack into the legislative process, which is to designate PFOS chemicals under CERCLA, which would potentially move liability from the polluter to those who are passive receivers of wastewaters and drinking water supplies that are containing PFOS potentially. So that's what's unifying us and what we're working on legislatively uh, with respect to a solution that is protective of public health and will ensure that cleanups happen by the responsible parties. Thank you, thank you, Eric, appreciate that. And um, I wanna go back to Adam quickly. Adam, on the state regulations for OWEHA that are being promulgated now, and, and there's some initial indications of the direction the state is going, um, how is CASA working to affect or take action and implement your uh, policies on these new regulations at, at, at the state level? Yeah, so I wish I had uh, Greg Kester, who's our director of renewable resource programs, has sort of taken a lead on a lot of this. And I wish I had him here to give a much more detailed answer. But I know that we took a very close look at what OEHA put out. We had some consultants sort of look at the numbers and see how that would impact us long term and sort of highlight some of the, the serious concerns about the scientific underpinnings of what was in the OEHA documents. So we did submit comments uh, on that. We were actively working on those issues and we'll continue to do so um, going forward because again, anything that's in that realm, even though it may not have a direct impact on wastewater immediately, it will down the road, much like the public health goals, much like a lot of other things. So we pay very close attention to those and, and we have been tracking it and commenting. Thank on. you. So every, every state can come up with its own maximum contaminant level. The EPA does not, so to speak, occupy the field for the entire nation. They set a standard, but every state can choose their own standard and California is choosing its own standard through uh, that process. Um, I'm going to, Stefan, regarding the, um, your communication with your U.S. representatives and elected officials, have you had an opportunity to share this problem and ask for some solutions and, or, and some, or some assistance from 
from them and what's been the response? Um, quite frankly, we'll, we'll talk to everybody who, who wants to listen. Uh, we've talking. We've talked to our um, local representatives, uh, state representatives, and even our federal representatives and senators um, about this uh, PFOS problem, um, primarily or uh, regarding the funding that it's going to take to clean this up, um, and not only the capital but also the O and M funding that it's going to take to to clean up this problem for uh, some of our water purveyors. Um, and they're listening, um, they're listening. And um, um, I think they're going to be supportive from what I'm hearing um, of trying to get um, some PFAS funds directed toward Cal Southern California um, so that we can uh, get this problem taken care of for the uh, constituents of, of not only WRD, but the specific water purveyors as well. Um, so it's, we probably touch bases with um, at least a dozen, dozen legislators to this point, um, and um, more to come, more to come, because we, until, until the money starts flowing, we won't stop talking. Exactly, exactly. Um, Eric, as it relates to the, the funding and that sort of thing, how do you see that coming down from Washington DC for, for wastewater and water districts? So we have some encouraging signs, if you will, the infrastructure law, the the what is it, the uh, hundred uh, the trillion dollar infrastructure uh, investment act, contained approximately ten billion dollars in it for PFAS related uh, technology treatment costs of cleanup, and then of course from from drinking water side, and then of course from the wastewater side, about a billion dollars to support the development of source control and pretreatment programs uh, in the form of grants to. Um, try and reduce the loadings of these chemicals before they hit the wastewater treatment operation. So I think from a sort of precedent setting basis, Congress has essentially said, there is a role here for federal funding. And the hope is as we move forward and there is a resolution of the overall PFOS legislative initiative that we will have additional federal funding that goes along with any kind of regulatory framework that Congress directs EPA to pursue. The, the challenge always is, and I just want to reemphasize this, is the notion of listing uh, these chemicals under Superfund is, is automatically a, a game stopper for the public agencies, because once that happens, then you throw into the mix the courts, and then it becomes very difficult to maybe secure federal assistance for cleanup if, in fact, there's litigation going on. Just speculation on my part, but something uh, sort of a tangential issue to the over issue, overall issue of polluter pays. But overall, I think we could look forward to continued congressional support in addressing this issue. But I think, as it shows from what Stephanie was saying and what Dennis was saying, the costs are truly, truly dramatic. And so you've got to find a way to make this happen so ratepayers aren't saddled with the burdens that, of a problem they didn't create. So, on a super fund, you would need to have a like an act, a contamination that perhaps that, that occurred there. And, and here we are the recipients of a lot of little acts of PFAS being in, in all kinds of materials, being in our in our Teflon and our clothing and here, there and there. So uh, are you hearing a real talk of a super of super fun occurring? Because that, that would be problematic with just our understanding of how we've worked with that in the past. Yeah, I think that's a fair statement, Steve. I think, you know, the challenge is whenever you have policy making decisions, there's always an unintended consequence of a decision. And in this case, simply designating these chemicals under CERCLA as hazardous substances creates a whole host of unintended consequences, specifically the fact that agencies like your own and Adam's membership are literally passive receivers of this. They had no role in the management and treatment and disposal of the PFOS originally, as you point out, they're in consumer products. So when you, so my experience, when you have a hazardous substance, let's say that you own, own land and um, you purchase that land from somebody that purchased it from someone else and that person hundred years ago or 50 years ago put, had hazardous substance released upon the property, all of the owners in the chain of title are responsible. And that's a real problem and so for, for, for talking about property and land and not necessarily PFAS. So when you talk about 
this hazardous substance, if you touch it, you're responsible for it. So in cleaning it up, the way the water districts are concerned that we could be liable for the way that we clean it up, even if we follow the process, and that when we are disposing of it, incinerating or to uh, put in a landfill, we could somehow be countersued by the very polluters that created the problem. And that's why we're trying to ask for this exemption that when the district, the wastewater and the water districts follow the proper rules and procedures to, to treat it, to dispose of it, we are not, we cannot be brought brought into a lawsuit because we're doing the public good and, and we should have that exemption. Correct? Yeah, I, think, I think that's fair, uh, more than fair. And I think just extend it out in case of Adam's membership, uh, aside from the wastewater treatment process, when you have the biosolids treatment process, the question becomes, to your point, you know, simply because it's in there and you dispose of it according to your permit conditions under the Clean Water Act or the uh, regulatory standards for issued by EPA and the state, that doesn't release you from the potential Superfund liabilities of land applying, for example, the, uh, the uh, biosolids. So it is truly, I, I'll call it a hydra headed monster in trying to figure out how you manage this without clear equitable treatment at the federal level to avoid 50 different state approaches. Thank you. So um, we had a, one of the questions that, that came up here and we will have a period for, for Q&A as we, as we come to the, to, to the end here. But I wanted to ask Dennis this, Dennis of the, of the facilities like the one that's there on your screen, what has been their preferred method of treatment and their preferred method of disposal? Oh, I thought you wanted to speak with me about um, looking beyond litigation. I was going to ask you about your glasses. I think those are pretty cool. <laughs> well, looking beyond litigation, Steve, which can take years, um, what we're doing to treat PFOS is uh, we're, we're getting out ahead of this. And we currently have 11 uh, facilities that uh, we're going forward with the design and construction. And we had unanimous support from our, uh, in a collaboration with our retail agencies to do that because that comes out of the replenishment assessment. Um, we're funding 100% of the design and construction of these facilities and the operation and maintenance cost is uh, shared 50-50 with the retail water agency. Um, but ultimately all of these costs are gonna be borne by our ratepayers. Um, 10 out of the 11 of our impacted agencies are considered disadvantaged communities. So it's essential we try to keep those water rates as low as possible. And, uh, and as we laid out, it's a very costly effort and we need state and federal funding to support our efforts. Um, last year, we worked with a coalition of impacted stakeholders as part of the uh, Community Water Systems Alliance to request state grant funding of uh, $250 million for PFOS cleanup. Um, 30 million was provided in the 2020, uh, excuse me, the 21-22 budget and uh, 50 million in the 22-23 and another 20 in the 22-24 budget. But as you can see, our, our costs far exceed this. Um, this year, we're working with the same coalition to request uh, $500 million for PFOS remediation funding in the state 22-23 uh, budget. Um, the counties impacted by PFOS in California include Orange, Riverside, San Diego, Los Angeles, Fresno, Alameda, San Joaquin, Butte, uh, Tulare, and Sacramento. So it's a statewide problem. Um, at the federal level, uh, 10 billion is included in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, information is still coming out about the availability of the funding. And so we're closely tracking that. Uh, because we've been so proactive uh, and swift in our efforts to address PFAS and, 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 and get ahead of this, our concern is that we won't be eligible for funding for the projects that we've already built or we're already designing and that are coming in line soon. And so we are hoping that uh, we're not going to get penalized for being proactive and getting out ahead of all this because Ultimately, our ratepayers pay for all this, and we're taking on an enormous amount of debt, hundreds of millions of dollars to pay for all this. So we're, we're certainly uh, hoping that we're not going to get penalized for getting out ahead and, and will not be eligible for future grant funding. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Eric, do we have some uh, proposed legislation for the exemption or want to touch on you know, some details in, in Washington, D.C.? We can 
kind of conclude up now and then we're going to go to question and answer. Yeah, I, I would just say the following. Um, on the heels of that trade association letter that you had up earlier, uh, the one thing that this debate has done is to unify the water sector. Um, and there is uh, legislative language, or shall we say policy approaches being developed and finalized that all the water sector interests have coalesced around. And I think the, the quickest way to, to answer your question, Steve, is that we are looking for the same treatment, if you, if you will, that HR 2467 provides to airports. And that is a, an exemption from liability simply because we have to accept these waters uh, for treatment and management and disposal. So we are, we are fortunate in the fact that the water sector at, in total, that basically represents the entire United States population is fully involved and united to try and secure such equitable treatment. And I noticed that you've got the groups identified here. I would just say, Steve, that um, folks should reference back to the uh, original letter that had more than just these groups, but these are the key water groups. Thank you. How likely do you think it is we'll get the Congress to provide this exemption for water and wastewater agencies? Um, you know, it's an open question. You never want to uh, give probabilities on something as contentious as Superfund legislation and, and trying to figure out a way to protect public health and not saddle ratepayers. But I think given the history, as I said, this started in 2019 and Congress has been unable to find a common path forward. Um, the fact of the matter is the, the votes haven't changed dramatically on this issue in the Senate and the Senate is closely divided. Um, so that in order to go forward, there's going to have to be an equitable treatment of the water sector or I don't see how they get something through. Now, that doesn't take away the issue from EPA with their regulatory initiatives. They're going forward, in, I mentioned earlier on the roadmap, and that includes designating PFOS as hazardous substances. So this started with this, this bill in, 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 the house, in, in the House of Representatives, and it was the PFAS Action Act, and it had it had addressed, um, or many industries were affected by this, not just water, there's semiconductors, and it's used in chip manufacturing, it's used in many things. What other types of industries is the uh, PFAS? I know in Bulletproof Vets, that, that came up in, in the debate. What other items are affected by this PFAS le legislation? Sure, I mean, when you think about it, the, the nature of this chemical and its properties and how it facilitates uh, product development and use by consumers. It's in, it was in pizza wrapping boxes, it, McDonald's wrappers at one point, I think. I'm not certain about that, but you know, it's all over. It's in clothing, it's in pots and pans, as you mentioned. So the issue is beyond the water sector, but the issue really is, should the water sector be held liable for something they didn't contribute to? Correct. And um, why do you think the, I, we know that the airports, they have this PFAS in their firefighting foam and there's an exemption for airports in the, in, in the bill. Why do you think there wasn't one put in for water or, or wastewater? You know, it's a good question. We, we tried to get that answer along the way. Um, and you know, the, there was never a definitive statement as to why it wouldn't be included. I think it really was just, uh, it was sort of the path of least resistance. Um, if we give an exemption to you, we have to give an exemption to those folks over there. And I just think it was a path of least resistance. It's my recollection, if I'm, tell me if I'm correct, that the bill went through a very, very quick process, not a typical process where you'd think of a bill's introduced and it might go to a committee and everyone can read it and and then they can debate it and vote on it. it might go to another committee and then go to the house floor. This this was like grease lightning. Is that a that was there was not a lot of time for involvement. Well, I think you know the, the process. I don't know if I go so far as to say it was grease lightning because nothing in Washington happens quickly. But I think the answer oh, really. Well, what is, they wanted to, it does actually. <laughs> right, but I think the answer really is ultimately that you know they the legislation it became a priority to get through the house. And, the, and I'd say the, the best way to get it through at that time was to limit the exemptions just to airports on the premise that airports were directed by 
uh, federal standards to use this firefighting foam that contained the chemical. Okay, and so it was approved in the House. We asked our, our House members from Orange County uh, to vote no on the bill. And there was, um, the, the, the bill was success and was approved, but some of the House members voted no as requested by the Orange County Water District and all of those agencies that you showed on the screen. Those members were uh, Representative Steele, Representative Kim, and then two representatives that we asked to vote no. They voted yes, that was Representative Korea and Representative Porter. So we need to communicate with them and we'll talk about that more, I suppose. Uh, the bill is now, it's in the Senate and it's, they're looking at it and we hope that they put in a, an exemption in it at, at that time and then it'll come back to the House and hopefully get approved very quickly. Is that a very Reader's Digest synopsis of we, how we hope this, that this occurs? Yeah, I think, yes. It would be the, how a bill becomes law, the standard way of doing it, yes. Okay, got it. Um, Let's see, uh, let me go back to Meta. How would you like us to open up for the questions and next steps? Sure, well, we could take it from here. Well, I did want to ask, um, you know, for Steve and our panelists, um, are there any final kind of closing remarks before Thank we you. open it up to audience Q&A? Are there any final points or messages or, or updates that you'd like to share that may or may not be addressed in our, our questions? And we'll go ahead and uh, start tackling those questions as well. Any final sure. thoughts? If I can just add for, for two minutes, yeah, I mean, we talked a lot about what's happening on the federal side, but on the state side, I wanted to do a, a little bit of a shameless plug. CAS is sponsoring legislation this year, uh, AB 2247 by Assemblymember Bloom on PFAS disclosure, and it would require manufacturers of PFAS or products containing PFAS to disclose the presence of those products uh, in a publicly accessible database. It's something we think is kind of an important first step. It's in line with all of this true source control um, you know, producer responsibility type things. And so, um, you know, we think it will be valuable information for our wastewater agencies to be able to act upon things uh, in a treatment context and then just identifying sources that come into our system. So I wanted to mention that on the state side and then some of the work that we're also doing with the state water board to gather data from their surveys and sort of convert it into being able to identify what potential sources are out there, uh, working with academic partners, just a number of things that we're doing, again, state level, but in every range from communications, the academic research, working with uh, regulators, and then working through state legislation to get this addressed uh, in addition to the federal level. So just wanted to mention a few of those. And if there's any follow-up questions on you know, what we're doing with that, um, always feel free to reach out to me directly. I would just say um, going forward, the best thing that people can do if they're concerned about this issue is to communicate to their elected officials the importance of addressing these issues and to ensure that liability impacts are, shall we say, addressed in a way that protect ratepayers and the ability of water and wastewater agencies to perform their primary mission. Thank you, Eric. And on the heels of that, I wanted to, to kind of echo something that Dennis said earlier that um, as an agency that's that's trying to get out in front of this problem, um, um, we really have hopes that when the funding comes down, that it, that we're not exempted from the funding and the grants because we've already expended money um, to take care of this problem. So uh, that's that's one of the, the message that we're trying to to get a, across to some of our our representatives and, and lawmakers. Well, Stephanie, you know the answer to that is no good deed goes unpunished unfortunately. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Dennis, did you want to, any last comment? You know, I want to get to the Q&A actually. Me too. Me too. Let's All go. right. Let's, Madam, why don't you take us to the Q&A? All right. We'll dive right in. And I want to mention that we did also get a couple questions in the registration process. We're, we're getting some live in the Q&A box. And so um, we'll kind of do a, a combination of, of a couple um, and, and make sure that if we don't get to your question in the time allotted today, we will be sure to follow up with you all with a written response after the webinar. So uh, please do continue with your with your questions and we'll make sure we touch base either today or shortly after. Um, Great. Did you so, want to re read one of the questions that you received? 
Sure, sure, sure. Um, and but maybe maybe I'll start with with one of these here too. Um, and and Eric um, and and possibly um, uh, Adam as well. You know, Eric, you represent um, several water and wastewater agencies, and we do have a question um, on um, what is happening in Northern California regarding this challenge. And, and Adam, being a statewide association as well, maybe you could uh, provide some some thoughts and perspectives on that. Well, I think given the fact that you know, I do work with Adam also, um, I, I'd say that the issue is, um, so can we say it's more about the biosolids at this stage of the game? I don't want to minimize wastewater. It's a concern too, because if wastewater is, as water recycling becomes more of an important piece of the Northern California water picture that uh, has always been a situation uh, in Southern California, um, that the waters have to be addressed too. But I think from a biosolids point of view, Adam, I'd say that you know there's deep, deep concern over the impact to biosolids management and disposal. Yeah, I agree. I think that tends to be the focus. I think the concerns are you know generally the same statewide, kind of as I articulated them earlier. Even though there's a little bit more um, action in Southern California related to some of the sites that exist and and taking um, you know certain wells offline and things like that. So. Uh, I would say not too much different, but Eric's right. I think biosolids is a huge emphasis uh, in Northern California. And then, you know, for those just looking for reference, I know the San Francisco Estuary Institute has done um, some good work looking at PFAS up there. And then some of the uh, agencies um, might have some information as well. So I would definitely refer you to those. Great, thank you so much. And um, you know, Steve, we did touch on this um, in some of our responses. We talked about funding, and, and one of the questions is, is, is what kind of state and federal funding is available to help with the PFAS cleanup costs? So if you'd like to respond or have one of our panelists Dennis, do you want to touch to that? You seem to have a lot of good information. And, and Eric, if you want to also add to Well, there, there is some coming forward, but unfortunately it's not quick enough for us because we have to move forward with our projects. So there's you know, much on the horizon through the feds, uh, through the Infrastructure Act, but uh, there's nothing that we can tap into right now immediately. I think there's, a, isn't there a few billion of reserve in California? <laughs> That's what I understand. <laughs> Eric? I, I think the uh, I think Stefan mentioned earlier there's about ten billion dollars in the infrastructure law, and dedicated to cleanups as well as treatment costs associated with cleanups. So, as a starting point at the federal level, there's money there, and then from an SRF state revolving loan fund program perspective, um, I believe that the drinking water SRF might be available to support cleanup efforts with respect to PFOS, but I have to check on that and get back with you. Thank you. So um, Meta, we have a few other questions and uh, that I have here on my um, screen. I, I think I'm gonna read one off. Great. From Carol, and it's, are those exemptions, the ones that we're referring to from litigation, are they from litigation, being exempt from litigation or are, are but uh, not for responsibility to deal with the exposure? So we're, are, we're, I can answer that, but I don't know if anyone else wants to touch on that question. Is the exemption related only to the, 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 the lawsuits and litigation? Is it also related to the, um, responsib the uh, responsibility by the local agency to get rid of the PFAS and treat it? So the, the way the exemption would work ideally is that you would not be liable under super fund. You would still be responsible for compliance with any standards and, and what have you under other environmental laws that apply to you. And I, the way that I read the question is, and it's, when I'm reading, it's, um, I think the second part was, are, would it make districts not required to clean up the PFAS? And my um, understanding is they're currently not required to clean up the PFAS. The legislation would not change that districts are cleaning up the PFAS, they're doing the right thing. The, um, the, I think we would, we're not allowed to serve the water that has PFAS at that certain contaminant level. But uh, we're currently, our duty to clean it up is voluntary, I believe. Yeah, that's what, yeah. oh, Maybe it would help, but I conceptualize them as kind of two different regulatory regimes. Right. We're talking right. really about surplus Superfund liability when we talk about this stuff. And, 
you know, getting an exemption from that doesn't really change whatever your responsibilities would or wouldn't be related to um, other types of cleanup. Correct. Um, we could um, not, we could sh shut off that water production well and buy imported water to replace that water, uh, as an example. And we have not, we've chosen not to do that. We've chosen to uh, expend a lot of money to clean up the PFAS. Another uh, good question was, airport, airports have had the problem of the fire foam. Uh, do the, does the firefighting foams continue to create an issue? Do, do the, is there still PFAS in the firefighting foam or is this a uh, PFAS from an older time? So as, as we understand right now, substitutes are being developed to replace PFAS. Um, a lot of the challenge that we're faced with right now is a function of the use of uh, firefighting foams that contain PFAS. And what I've read is that, as Eric alluded to, that there is a lot of technology changing with the PFAS and it's a necessary part of all these goods that we mentioned earlier, but that um, cancer causing element in the PFAS has been removed out of it with PFAS that is being, being utilized today. And I, I'm not gonna swear that I'm 100% correct, but that's what I've read in, in some of the research that, that I have done, because it certainly, um, that would certainly make sense. The um, other question is, uh, could, could the Environmental Protection Agency, do they have the power to grant this exemption for circular liability, or does that have to come from the Congress? So our understanding is that CERCLA does not provide exemptions other than the ones that are in law. So if you were developing a brownfield uh, area, you, you would be able as the developer to seek a, a liability exemption under the CERCLA provisions. Um, similarly, if it was an act of God uh, that caused the problem, liability would not occur. But generally speaking, uh, we don't believe EPA has the authority to waive uh, liability under CERCLA. So we would we would need we would need a statute to add that exemption to, to existing law. Yeah. EPA does not have the power to grant that exemption. Yeah, I would say the one consideration we want, and because we have talked about it with folks um, and made the argument that there are some existing exemptions, and so there are. You know, there are interpretations where you'd say, okay, some of our activities fall under those, but um, I don't think anyone is very comfortable with that. I think a very clear exemption is absolutely what is preferred and needed. Um, but just in terms of, you know, what exists in EPA's interpretation, that just may be one thing. To no, we, we absolutely need and deserve a very clear exemption in, yeah. in, 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 in statute, not in a regulatory, yeah. um, you know, staff driven manner. It, sh yeah. it should be passed by the Congress and approved by the president. Yep. So I think we're done with our questions and I uh, wanted to ask Meta, do we have some information on, on, on the website and where folks can go to get more information and uh, take action potentially? We, we sure do and we'll pull that up here. Thank you. you want, to, want to tell tell us about that Meta, please? Sure, sure. Um, you know, um, I do want to uh, just, Indeed. you know, mentioned that um, you know, OCWD has a robust uh, PFAS education center uh, with a lot of information on uh, what um, you know, legislation, regulations that are, that are occurring, uh, various stakeholders that are supporting this effort as we talked about today. And we also have a, a, an area on our website here called uh, Take, Take Action. Uh, we want folks to, to learn and get educated and, and get involved um, by you know, reaching out to your local members of Congress. Um, and we also have uh, template letters and um, you know, encourage you to, to share in our, and share with your members and your uh, constituents and um, get involved in our advocacy efforts as well. And uh, we will be sure to share this link with you all after the uh, webinar also, uh, but we do have a resource for you available should you uh, be interested. Thank you. I think, I, think all, I think everyone is concerned about this issue and everyone would want to certainly do the right thing on this issue. We need to just you know, provide education and information and, and uh, hopefully we can have that occur. Um, and, any, I think we're, we're about ready to sign off on the hour, that's great, we're on time. Is there any other closing comments anyone would like to make before we go?
great. Well, we're we're off uh, we're off early. It's twelve fifty five twelve fifty seven. Thank you all for joining, and uh, we'll be having another webinar on this in the immediate future. Have a nice rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.